This is FAQ NYC Off Cycle, where the New Yorkers podcast from the newsroom by and for New Yorkers, the city, steps back to take different and deeper looks into some of the things that are always happening here in the only place in the world. I'm Katie Honan. For much of Todd Maisel's career as what he calls a psycho news guy, he's listened to the crackle of police scanners to look for his next story. That sound could now vanish as the New York City Police Department has moved to encrypt its communications on all of its channels by the fall of 2024. Todd is semi-retired and not chasing fires and murders around New York City anymore, but he knows how important it is for the public, that's the reporters, the photographers, and even the violence interrupters, to have access to these crucial communications. He wrote a bombshell series for AM New York recently that laid out the consequences of the NYPD's change. And in 2019, he put it simply, how will you know if there's news if the NYPD decides that they don't want you to know? You're not going to know. So Todd joins us here today to talk about this. Todd, I really thank you for joining us and, and really shining a light. You've kind of been the main person ringing the bell, sounding the alarm on this. So um, I just want to, you know, just take it back real quickly. When did you first hear the rumors and rumblings about the NYPD's move to encrypt its radio communications? Well, I, I first heard about this back in 2019. And I, I originally found out that, uh, that they were getting new radios and they were spending uh, upwards of half a billion dollars on that. Um, to this day, I think that they've spent close to a billion dollars on communications alone. That's a huge number. They, they don't tell you what they spend that money on. They just keep it secret. But what I found out back in 2019 was that they plan to do this. And so I went to an interview with then Commissioner James O'Neill. And I was with a Newsday reporter. And he did his interview, and I was the photographer. And at the end of the interview, I said to him, what are you doing about encryption? And are you including the uh, press in that? And he laughed at me. And he said, "And he said, what are you, Colombo? And he said, why don't you ask DCPI about this? So I asked DCPI. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't tell me. They wouldn't share any information with me. And I started probing around. I started talking to the radio experts. And they were telling me it could be a couple of years out. And I said, well, this is the time to start talking about it. Um, so I finally got one police official to say, the radios will go dark. You will hear nothing. And that's when I had my first story in December of 2019. Yeah. And I didn't get much reaction out of the rest of the media or the public. And then I wrote a second story. And then I wrote a third. And one news outlet wrote a story interviewing John Miller. John Miller, who was the deputy commissioner at the time, said, oh, don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to include you. Everything will be fine. I didn't believe him. Uh, I don't believe him to this day. I, finally, we have encryption. We have six precincts that are encrypted. And I asked John Miller, John, what happened? You said that we would be included. We're not. One of the things that, um, you know, I thought that was so good in your story, because I know the the media and police relations, you know, Former Commissioner O'Neill laughing at you, that might give some example of how they sometimes view the press, um, combative and and just generally not helpful. Uh, that's sometimes my um, relationship with DCPI, although I don't deal with them as much anymore. Um, but I know in your story, you kind of point out it's not just, you know, it's not just the psycho news guy driving around or whoever trying to get stuff. It's violence interrupters. And I also wanted to ask, how does this affect, you know, volunteer ambulance corps or even um, the way that they interact with the EMTs? It's an, I know that was a big issue during 9-11 that you had the fire department and the radio and, and the NYPD on different radio channels. How do the non-journalists actually, how does this actually hurt them in terms of the work that they do? And just even the general public, I mean, we can argue about whether Citizen is, is actually a beneficial app for people, but they are also are affected too. So if you want to just talk a little bit about how 
the non-media people that DCPI can't laugh at will be hurt by this? I think that it's essential for the public to know what goes on in their city. I think that it's important for people to know when there's a shooting in their community, maybe they should stay in the house. Um, There's a toxic fire near their house. Maybe they should want to know that. And maybe they want to stay in, close their windows. Maybe they don't want to be near it. Maybe they want to get out of the neighborhood for that matter. Uh, a building collapse, a, a major fire. Um, they should know. Citizen helps with that. Um, the On 9-11, the uh, emergency services would have been helpless without volunteers that who showed up that day. I showed up. I carried two firefighters out of there. We were, we are needed. The public needs to know what is going on in their city so that they can assist first responders if need be, or to be knowing not to be near a certain situation. I think it's very important. I think it's a real danger to the public not to have real time news. I think delays would be real significant to not only news operations trying to report breaking news, but to the public who really need to know what's happening around them in real time. Um, You know, in reading what you wrote you in AM New York, a lot of the people who you spoke to said basically um, how crucial it is to hear the radios. Obviously, you're chasing it. Um, I uh, was a big Tabloid Wars fan, so we saw your work in action listening to the radios, getting to the scene. Um, You told me last week, uh, looking at a city like Albany, which I believe you said has encrypted radios, how the news media there just, they show up when the scene is over. They don't get witnesses. They don't get that. So if you want to describe a little bit for listeners who are not listening to the radios, what that is like hearing when the radios are working properly, when you can hear everything, um, and just how beneficial that is for members of the media to, to be there as, as quickly as possible to get the most accurate um, picture of what's happened. There are communities in New York State and in other states where there is encrypted radios and the press doesn't get information until the next day, sometimes several days later. I've seen news reports where the press shows up and the tape is down. The witnesses are gone. The victims are in the hospital or or worse. And the information to the public is is very poor. I, I think that this is a real danger to to, to uh, freedom of the press and, and to the, and to the public to not know what goes on in their neighborhood. Without our reporting, people wouldn't understand what goes on. They wouldn't see victims of shootings. They wouldn't see the reaction of families who have lost loved ones, they'd be, they, they would lose that whole emotion. And without that emotion, people won't care. They won't care that there's crime because if you don't see crime out of sight, out of mind, I guess it's not happening. Yeah. But it, it is, it is for the people who have suffered with that. And the people who will suffer later on because they don't know that there's crime in that neighborhood, that there's things going on. And just the police coming out and sending us emails about the basics on a uh, on a crime. It's really not enough. And it loses something in the translation. And then the public doesn't understand the gravity of gun violence and 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 other things that affect them and and that that's a real danger i mean and the other point and you and you pointed this out to me too a, a case like what happened with eric garner that was what happened over the police radio obviously there was an eyewitness video 
um, that was crucial to know to understanding what was happening. But to rely solely on the NYPD account, which oftentimes is not true, perhaps uh, I'm, I'm not going to say intentionally untrue, but what they put out, especially in those sheets, is is not always the case. And you need witnesses, you need to be there, and you need people to be there. So I just wanted to ask. Um, you know, I know in, in the article, the NYPD, I guess, has been a little bit dismissive of going back to Jimmy O'Neill laughing at you. Um, what has the police response been when you were writing the story? And I don't know if you've received any updates since these the series has come out. What I found is that the police are uh, now finally reacting, finally starting to talk about what they can do to include the press. Uh, I think I've created a situation where other media now realize the danger to the public and the danger to their own profession, that they won't know when news occurs. They'll know long after. And this has been, the police do this. You won't know negative stories like Eric Garner. You won't know. They grab the video and then they don't tell you they have it. This is a big problem. I, I've been to stories where they'll grab security video and embargo it at the scenes of crimes. We get there early enough, we're able to show the public what is actually happening. Stories like Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, you won't know. Look at, look at George Floyd. The guy is murdered by a police officer, but what the cops initially reported was that he died of a medical emergency. Yeah. He died of a medical emergency? It, they, they, they had to fess up once that young woman came yeah. forward with nine minutes of strangulation. Nine minutes. It took that much. And so here we are, after Black Lives Matter, and people marched in the streets, and we're going to reduce transparency, the police. Do we trust the police to tell the truth? I don't. I don't trust the police to tell the truth. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are police officers, but I got to tell you, there have been many stories where the police have not been truthful or they lie by omission. Mm. Just don't tell you. You're not going to know when there's a negative story about the police. You might know in social media, but they're not going to tell you. There's not going to be information. You won't. The press won't get there to, to talk to the witnesses until long after. The witnesses will be gone. This is a real tragedy. And it's bad for the public. It's bad for checks and balances. It is a real problem. And I, I think that the rest of the media are waking up. And I think the police themselves are understanding more. They had no intention of sharing their frequency with us. No intention whatsoever. Because they've been working on this for five years. And then they come into a meeting with us. And they say they don't have a plan. Yeah, they had a plan. Their plan was to not share anything. To be completely in control of the narrative. And if you trust the police to be in complete control of the narrative, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say to elected officials who have stayed silent on this. Where is Jamani Williams on this? Is he also in bed with the police? I can't believe that. Not for a second. Where is Adrian Adams, who was busy with the Black Lives Matter. She was in favor. They they even let the uh, the protesters camp outside of City Hall. Where are they today? Do they not recognize the danger of encryption, of regressive transparency policy? Mm -hmm. They will be presiding over the most regressive transparency policy in the history of New York City, if not the state. And what goes on in New York City is the example for the rest of the country because, yeah, we have the greatest police department 
in probably the world. And we are the example for everybody. And if they are allowed to hide and and be the secret police, and that's what they are, because they 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 did intend to encrypt their radios without giving any access. I've tried to foil them, 10 foils. They rejected, saying it's secret, it's secret. They wouldn't share whether or not they had a competitive bid on a half a billion dollar contract. They wouldn't share any details. You know what? I don't trust them. And anybody that does, I I, I don't know what to say to them. I know in some cities there have been issues when they've encrypted radios. I don't know if you can talk a little bit about other major cities um, and what their radios are like with with police. I mean, not like Albany. That's I know it's a capital, but I don't consider that a major city. But are there places like Los Angeles or or Chicago what they have? Well, I can tell you that uh, Chicago has had some real problems. Uh, they have a thirty minute delay. Their new mayor has promised to to roll that back. Uh, we shall see. Uh, Baltimore has rolled back their encryption for the press, and now they give. I believe a 15 minute delay. Um, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, has also rolled back their encryption to a 15 minute delay. Uh, San Diego is completely dead. It's dark. You hear nothing. The press there are besides themselves. Um, it has spurred legislation in the state Senate in California to stop encryption, to roll back encryption. Palo Alto has completely rolled back their encryption. The uh, California Highway Patrol uh, is not encrypting uh, because they understand that the press and the public need to know what is going on with what they do. And we have to not hide it. We have to not hide for safety reasons of the public, but also for checks and balances. And and that's important. Anybody that remembers, for example, the West Indian Day Parade, if you listen to the radio, you hear racist comments. We shouldn't hide this. We need to know. We need to know what our police officers are thinking. Because if we stop them and, and intervene, when they are making racist comments over the radio, we can probably stop them from abuse. And I've seen abuse. I've intervened in abuse. I have showed up to scenes and I've seen, in one case, a burglary suspect being beaten up by the cops. And I walked into the middle of it and I flashed my flash and I took a picture and they stopped what they were doing. I saw a police captain beating a handcuffed suspect with his gun. And I stopped him. I've seen other things. And I got to tell you, without these checks and balances, the police will run amok. They will do what they want. And society will suffer. And it will get worse and worse. The interesting thing um, about your Involved, and I know you've been on it since before you retired, but you know, you're not even down here that much anymore now. So I know you said to me last week that you're kind of doing this for for us. And and by us, I mean other reporters, other photographers. I mean, do you see this as, as so many years chasing stories? I mean, how do you view this in the larger context of your career? Uh, you know, I see it from from my perspective, is it's like, you know, you're sacrificing a lot of time and energy in what you should be, you know, hanging out in the Berkshires. I don't know, do you have ponds or rivers over there hunting or whatever they do up there? Um, but instead, you're spending a lot of your post news life still trying to protect the reporters and the photographers and the news people and the people of New York City. So I don't know if you view it in such, um, that's the way I see it, but I don't know how you view it for yourself. I spent 40 years doing this. Do you make big money doing it? No, nobody does. You know, nobody's in this business because they, they're looking to make a fortune of money. Uh, there are other ways to do that. Um, uh, if you're not committed to this, what are you doing in this business? Well, so I taught a lot of, of the new people on the street 
how to do the job. I gave them advice. I worked with them. I used to take people in my car and chase with them and show them how I did it and, and hope to pass that on. It, it It's more than the business is more than just a job. It's more than just the paycheck. And anybody that thinks that it, that it is really needs to get the hell out of the business because it, it's about more than just myself and what I do and what I did. It, it's about society. It's about freedom of speech. It's about the first amendment. And here we got all these cops taking a, an oath. I watched the promotions the other day and they take a promotion to swear to protect the constitution. And guess what? We represent the first amendment and the founders of this country had a good reason for making freedom of the press, the first amendment. And it's up to the police department to understand that and understand that having a free press is vital to the public and vital to them. Pat Lynch, the former president of the PBA, once told me that 95% of what we do in the field, photographers, reporters, are favorable to them. Maybe 5% is not so good. So I, I ask the police department, I say, think about that. Think about what's going to happen when you cut us off. Will your budgets increase? I'm not so sure. Uh, there's an experiment going on in Nassau County now. Nobody knows what they do. Um, the press out there, for some reason, has decided that this is okay. I don't think it's okay. Nobody knows when there's a shooting out there until it's long past done. You get there, it's over. The witnesses are gone. Crime doesn't exist out there? Really? Well, ask the, the victims out there. My uh, my other question is, I guess, just what would be the ideal next step? You know, if you're saying that you think the police has spent close to a billion dollars on these radios, I mean, how long of a road or I guess how much noise needs to be made for the police to reverse this encryption? And is it, is it even a possibility that they could do it in, in any kind of, you know, I know by the fall of 2024, everything's going to be going silent. So I don't know what your, I guess the likelihood of them maybe reversing or, or what else needs, maybe more elected officials need to be involved. Look, I don't expect them to reverse encryption. I think that there are real reasons why you want to do what you're doing. And the police have had real good reasons to update their radios uh, they have had interference on the radios, which has zero to do with the members of the media. Um, maybe 10% of the interference that they've suffered on those radios was from Chinese-made Baofeng radios. 90% was because people lost radios in the field. Their cops lost radios, and they had interference, and they had to track those people down. That has nothing to do with us. They think that uh, the bad guys can listen in. That doesn't happen. The only people that understand what the cops are saying are us, the members of the media. Because you have to really be listening for a long period of time to even understand what they're saying, to understand the codes, to understand how they operate. They don't necessarily provide their locations, unless it's a, a a local radio, precinct radio, where they're saying where they're going, but they don't say where they're sitting. They don't say that. Um, that there, there are other reasons here that they 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 should share the radios with us, and I, I just don't understand why we become the enemy. We've always been their friends. I have friends all the way up to the top of the, of, of the ranks. And I don't understand 
when did we become the enemy and why? And just officially, I mean, what has been the official reason that the, I guess, just updating radios or is it privacy or, I mean, are they still saying, I know a lot of times when the NYPD does peculiar things, they throw down, well, you know, safety, 9-11, we have to protect everybody. Um, but I don't know what what that line, official line has really been. Well, I can tell you that the official line has been a bunch of bull. And, and, and that's the truth. They can't handle the truth, of course. Um, they will throw out to us that, well, people have interfered with the radios. False has nothing to do with the press. Um, they claim that there's privacy. Yes, the privacy of the victims. They do not put over private information. They don't put over names or anything. Every one of them has a police department issued phone. How could they say that? They don't do that. Even the fire department has what they call a mixer off. When they have private information they need to broadcast, they hit a mixer off on their radio, and all the private information is private. It's secret. And and that was part of what the federal government was saying, that they wanted the police departments to not broadcast to the public private information. I understand that. They don't have to put private information over and they have not been doing that. So what is their excuse? They don't want us to show up so early and take pictures of what's going on. Let me tell you, they have used my pictures in a number of situations to to bolster their cases against criminals. I don't want to hear that. They that I'm some sort of interference. I've never interfered with them. I'm a fly in the wall when I can be. I'm there to document what they're doing. And I'm good for them. I've always been good for them. And so are my colleagues. They, we are good for them. We show them doing a great job. And 90%, 95%, maybe more percent of the time, they do a great job. They're professionals. And sometimes they're not. And I've had to tell cops who have said to me, hey, no pictures, no pictures. And I say to them, make sure that your your uh, camera is on and say it again. And I had one sergeant turn around to him and say, shut up. <laughs> Yeah, now that they have the body cams. Now that they have the body cams, that's right. And uh, they're they're pretty slow to share that with us. Mayor Adams had said that they would, you know, give body cam footage easily, which I don't believe. Yeah, right. I'm sure his his, (laughs) the NYPD. foils, right. (laughs) Yeah. Like the information requests. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, every time they deny it or or, or they say, oh, well, it's it's for a, a criminal case. We have to hold on to it. Yeah, okay. There's no transparency here. That's what they're looking for. They're looking to control the narrative and and reduce the transparency. And you've got a progressive city council who is presiding over this. And I say, what are you guys doing? One final question, and you know, I mean, you could have the last word on this, and maybe could be a real warning. Not that this whole conversation hasn't been, but my colleague Ravane Blau at, at the city, he broke the story about the, how the Department of Correction would no longer release when uh, a detainee died on Rikers Island and in city jails. Um, I think the commissioner said that it was, um, you know, not respectful to the families, even though we never get that information before the families. It seemed like to quote you a lot of bull as a reason for that. But between that and between what's happening with the radio encryption, I mean, what is your warning, whether it be for any listeners, I know people from the city council listen to this, what's the message you want to get across about how, you said this is a regressive transparency and it's and it's in the police and it seems to be in a lot of law enforcement agencies. So I guess, what is that final message that you want to get across to the people who maybe have the power who can do something to change this? It's our elected officials who have the ability to change and to rein this in. They ha- the, the city council has the ability to, to, to stop them from
from doing this, from stopping encryption. But every year they go into a budget hearing and they go ahead and they say, oh, take the money. Here's a couple of hundred million dollars uh, for communications. But they don't seem to understand what they're making this budget for. They don't understand what, what the police are doing with it. They, they know that they're using it for radios and communications is very important. And I don't say that the, that the police shouldn't have new radios. They should. They should have the most modern technology. But at the same time, if it results in a regressive transparency policy, elected officials better start thinking about what they're doing here, that they're creating what I say is the secret police. And it's up to elected officials to step up and start questioning this. And I'll tell you this, if they think that I'm going to stop and others are going to stop talking about this all the way up to next year, they're mistaken. This is not going away. They need to, 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 to negotiate in good faith. They lied to us. They said that there wouldn't be any encryption until 2024. We now have six precincts that are encrypted. Was it a test? Well, I can tell you that the 8884 precinct were tested previously. This is not a test. This is real. This is real time transparency regression and it's got to stop here and now and it has to be open to media they are not a private organization they serve us they serve the public and they forgot Admezel, thank you so much for speaking with me but also obviously for your work on this you've been really ahead of this for a long time and um i know a lot of media picked it up after you wrote about it and i hope that the elected officials kind of follow suit. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for giving this the, the proper attention. FAQ. This has been FAQ NYC. We're part of The City, a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom dedicated to hard-hitting reporting that serves the people of New York. Our work is freely available to everyone at thecity.nyc and is supported by listeners and readers like you. Go to thecity.nyc slash give if you'd like to pitch in. We are an affiliate of NYU's McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research and a proud member of the Brickhouse Cooperative of Independent Journalists, Critics, and Artists. Find it all at popula.com. Our host today was me, Katie Honan. Our engineer was Adam Kamara, and Harry Siegel is our executive producer. Thank you so much to our guest, Todd Maisel, and thank you, listener, for joining us and making it this far. Stay cool and stay safe, and we'll see you next time.